So in 1 Corinthians 4 to 11 through 13, we're moving our way through chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, it goes as this, and Paul goes on to write of himself and Apollos in their actual state, which amplifies their devotion to duty to God, as well as their difficult circumstances permit. Four eleven, to this present hour we are both hungry and thirsty, and are poorly clothed, and are roughly treated, and are homeless, and we toil working with our own hands. They're supposed to be taken care of by the congregation, but they nevertheless toil working with their own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. Notice that rather than obligate the Corinthian congregation to care for their needs as they are supposed to do, Paul and Apollos toiled, working with their own hands to provide for themselves instead. Why did they do this? Well, and they did this to not obligate the believers at Corinth, despite their ill treatment by those at Corinth, who thought of themselves as mature believers, all the while disputing amongst themselves about who is the one to follow, Paul, Apollos, Peter or Jesus Christ, by virtue of their own opinions. They have their own opinion. They don't worry about the Word of God. And are not according to the teaching of Paul, Apollos, Jesus, or, or Peter. 1 Corinthians 4.13. It goes like this. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. So, correct this. So, Despite the self-aggrandizing, glowing reports of the Corinthian believers about their own circumstances, the circumstances of Paul and Apollos, by comparison, were difficult at best. They were hungry, thirsty, poorly clothed, roughly treated, homeless. They toiled, working with their own hands, despite the obligation of fellow believers at Corinth to support them. They are poorly clothed, roughly treated, and without a place to stay, despite the obligation of believers in Corinth to aid them. And, and Paul and Apollos are slandered by some at Corinth. And despite this ill treatment, they nevertheless tried to conciliate with the very ones that slandered them. Paul writes that they have become to those believers in Corinth as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things even until now. They held a high opinion of themselves outside of what the Word of God would have to say and put Paul and Apollos below them when they were the very teachers that taught them the gospel and they came to Christ by faith alone. Expositor's Bible commentary on these verses. 11 to 13, to set their record straight, Paul goes on to describe in detail the hardships he and fellow Christian workers have suffered throughout their ministry. The expressions to this very hour and up to this moment uh, amplify that. He first emphasizes the physical deprivations they were suffering, hunger, thirst, lack of clothing, rough treatment, and homelessness to remind the Corinthians again that he has no desire to be a physical burden to them, he injects the statement, we work hard with our own hands. Then Paul continues the list of his sufferings. I like the word Paul in here. Sometimes it helps to do a little addition and correction. This time he mentions mainly the verbal abuse Paul and his friends took and their response to it. They were frequently reviled. But they called on God to bless their revilers. He interjects, when we are persecuted, we endure it. Then he goes back to the theme of verbal abuse. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Climaxing this moving passage, Paul states that he and his fellow workers have become the scum of the earth and the refuse of all men. Boy, that's in store for the faithful Christian to suffer for the sake of Christ. Certainly he went to these same sufferings and more. 414 to 421, Paul writes, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. Ah, for in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. Therefore I exhort you, be imitators of me. 
For this reason I have sent you, Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. So Paul is not boasting and arrogant like the Corinthians were without education in the word of God, but giving you the, the truth of the matter and in a humble way, living through suffering at the hands of the Corinthian believers who were arrogant and thought they were better. Now some have become arrogant, there you go, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. Do they have the power of Christ, or do they have under their own power? For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. You can say the words, but the power is in Christ, and whether God will respond with his power. What do you desire? Paul asks. Shall I come to you with a rod, or with love and a spirit of gentleness? He prefers, obviously, the latter. Here's a manuscript evidence. Not too important. Become imitators of me, as I also am of Christ. Kind of added there, but doesn't make a difference in the meaning. Not, not important, not significant. So, we move on in the commentary on 14 to 21. Look at, always, I always put the verses first so you can look back quickly and see what the words say in my interpretation, make sure it's right on. So in 1 Corinthians 4, 14 and 15, Paul wrote, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children, for if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. After having composed this, the last section, 1 Corinthians 4, 6 to 13, whereupon Paul admonishes the believers of Corinth for their lack of maturity, even their arrogance in claiming to be superior to himself and Apollos and Peter in spiritual maturity, as opposed to the dire circumstances that he, Apollos, and Peter have been and will be subjected to, he writes that his intention was not to shame them, but to admonish them as his beloved children, referring to their salvation unto eternal life occurring solely as a result of his preaching the gospel to them, in the sense of being their spiritual father. For Paul stated that should countless tutors and teachers in Christ were to come along and teach them, they would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, in the sense of solely through the teaching of Christ to them by Paul, it was Paul alone who became their father, their spiritual father, through his preaching to them of the gospel. Then in the next two verses, Paul wrote, Therefore I exhort you, be imitators of me. For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and will remind you of my ways, which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Notice that Paul exhorted the Corinthian believers to be imitators of himself. This might have been a startling thing to write down in light of the Corinthian believers' personal opinion about their, their own grandiose and mature status in the Christian faith and life is opposed to their indication of the lowly status of Paul compared to theirs, which Paul sarcastically addressed in 1 Corinthians 4, 7-13. And Paul wrote that he sent Timothy, who, de who Paul declared was his beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind the believers of, the Paul, of Paul's ways, which he declared and wrote, are in Christ, adding, they are in Christ just as I teach everywhere in every church. So Paul was to be their example to learn by and look up to. Paul was not to be looked upon, down upon, as one who lacked the spiritual maturity and grandeur as some of the Corinthian believers claimed themselves to have. Then, let's take a look at another of my favorite commentaries, Bible Knowledge Commentary, BKC. See what it has to say. Prompted by love. Agape self-sacrificial love. Certainly he was, because he was doing the work and housing himself to support himself when his work at the Corinthian church should have been supported by their members. Paul issued a warning. His purpose in writing the biting irony of the preceding verses was not simply to shame the Corinthians, but if it did not shame them, they were calloused indeed. His goal was to bring about a change of heart and a manner of life in them. His motivation was love, like that of a father for his children. I want to write in there agape, because there is a self-sacrificial love Godly. 
love like that of a father for his children. Fathers are supposed to express a godly, self-sacrificial love toward their children, as well as the mothers. Many ministers might address, advise, and instruct the Corinthians, but only one had planted the seed that brought them life. More than any guardian, Galatians 3.24, Paul had their interests at heart. For that reason, he urged them to imitate him. He had one spiritual child who did just that, namely Timothy. Timothy could remind them by precept and example of Paul's way of life in Christ Jesus. Paul, Timothy was an example of Paul's way of life in Christ Jesus, which was in turn an imitation of their Lord. We can do the same. Won't be perfect like Christ was, but it's in that direction and people will notice. Exposure's Bible Commentary in 14 to 17. I did not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. The what? The, the Allah, but. But to admonish the position of the participle shame and Nusran, the Greek word for warn, at opposite ends of the sentence, emphasizes the contrast by putting stress on the second, warn, as the result of the apostle, the, the result the possible really, really desires. He'd rather the latter. They become with a gentle love and not an admonishment for punishment or discipline. 15. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I become your father through the gospel. Again, if the condition is to be taken here, if the conclusion is, if you should were to have to mean even though you have, you certainly do not have many fathers, you have many who have come to you, countless tutors, but only one father. The contrast is strong between many fathers and I have fathered you. The words are important here. Therefore, I exhort you to be imitators of me. We have the Greek word mimitai from which we get the word mimic, which simply means imitators of, a fitting description of the role of little children who naturally imitate the actions and attitudes of their fathers and mothers. Present form of the dynamic verb become, here is graphic, continue to become in practice imitators, an ongoing thing. In verse 17, grammatically expression either Lord can go with both beloved and faithful. My child, beloved and faithful in the Lord, meaning referring to Timothy. And then Paul concludes this section of 4, 1 to 21 with a challenge for the Corinthian Christians to be spiritually humble. And to this end, he says that he has sent Timothy to help them and then he himself will come too. Here it is. Paul now explains that his seeming harshness in writing this to the Corinthians was not to shame them, but to warn them of the seriousness and perverseness of their actions and their pride. You go too far with that, you get out of fellowship. He grants that they have countless guides or guardians, but denies that they have spiritual fathers to advise them. But since he has begotten them in Christ, i.e. by Christ's atoning work through the gospel that he shared with them, and is therefore their spiritual father, he feels he has a right to advise them, therefore. And speaking of the leaders of the Corinthians as, as guardians, the apostle is calling attention to the distinction between himself, their spiritual father, and those leaders, many of whom could be called guardians or guides. In the ancient Roman Empire, pedagogy indicated slave guides who escorted the boys to and from school and were in charge of their general contact, conduct. So in a sense, they could be called instructors. Hodge as well as said that there are three agencies used by God for the conversion of men. The efficiency is in Christ by his spirit. Administrative agency as in preachers. The instrumental agency is in the word. Since Paul could righteous, rightfully claim to be their spiritual father, he feels he can ask them to become imitators of him. So, in the light of Paul's rightful claim to be their spiritual father, he feels he can ask them to become imitators of him. And in the light of this, of this request, he says he has sent Timothy to, to them to help them in their progress. Timothy, too, was Paul's beloved child, begotten through the gospel and faithful in the Lord, i.e., in his service for Christ. Though Paul mentions having sent Timothy, the latter was evidently not the messenger who brought the first Corinthian letter. It is true that I have sent, the phrase rendered I have sent, can well be taken to mean I have sent him, and he has just arrived with first Corinthians, which is uh, an epistolatory erist, pointed action, but emphasis, em, 
FM'sa 